Hi, I think we are five minutes late, so I think we can start now. Maybe the, the screen is here, so maybe maybe you're not, you're, you're not able to see the, the slides. So you want to change or you, you, you feel okay? So whatever you want. So uh, before we start this, this conference today, I would like to ask you a question. How many of you have ever worked on a monolith? Raise your hand. <laughs> Almost everybody. That's the reason why you're here, right? <laughs> and how many of you are currently working on a monolith? Currently. <laughs> Almost everybody. OK, you are in the right talk then. So today we're going to talk about uh, event sourcing, common core responsibility segregation. We're going to talk about calling about our different technologies. But that uh, we're going to go deep into these technologies. This talk is about the, the experience uh, that we had from slicing a monolith to a new microservices using these technologies. So basically, you want to know about more about event sourcing and these technologies, you can, I don't know, go to Wikipedia, uh, Amazon Books, whatever, uh, because basically, basically today we're going to talk about our experience about us. So welcome all. It's funny because uh, as you, I've worked my whole experience, I've, uh, I've been working with, um, with monoliths. I've been working for more than 10 years in monoliths and in different companies, and all these companies shared that they, these characteristics. They had a monolith. Uh, some companies started with a monolith, some companies maintain a monolith, but they all have a monolith. So I've seen all kinds of monoliths. I've seen big monoliths, I've seen small monoliths, <laughs> well-tested monoliths, bad tested monoliths, all kinds, colors, and flavors. So as you will see today, uh, in Wallapop, in our company, we also have a monolith. For the people that don't, don't know Wallapop, Wallapop is the, is the biggest second-hand market in Spain. So basically, you, if you have something that you don't use, you upload a picture, someone will make an offer and start a conversation, and at some point, you meet in the street, and then you sell the item and in exchange of money, of course. As I was saying, in our company, we have a monolith, a big, big monolith. It, he started the company. We actually love our monolith. He's big, but we love him because if, we, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have the company. So he's the creator of our job positions. We love him so much that we even gave him a name. So please let me, let me introduce you all to Manolito. A big applause <laughs> to him. So from now on, I will be talking about uh, Manolito the whole time instead of monolith, you know. And um, so yeah, what do we have in Manolito? In Manolito and Wallapop, you can, you can find the users, the management of the users, you can find the management of the items, you can find the management of chat conversation, you can find basically everything. And from the scope of this, of this, of this uh, talk, you can find also a payments platform, okay? So we have like a small payments platform in there that manages the, 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 the cards and the bank accounts. At some point, our business analyst came up with this project. So why don't we make our service transactional? And what does it mean? It means that we make our users able to send their items even though they don't live in the same location. So for example, a user in Madrid can sell an, uh, an item to a user in Barcelona. So using, of course, a delivery platform. So of course, OK, let's do it. It sounds like a, like a, good, pro a good project, so let's do it. And then the developers we met, and then we thought, what about doing in Manolito? Well, we can do it in Manolito because it's just basically put adding the code there, the pile into production is there, the metrics, everything is there. So mm, let's study the, if, if it's good or if it's a bad solution. So first of all, in Manolito, in Manolito was very bad tested. We didn't have end-to-end -end, end -end test. And this, was, this project involved money. If it, if it involves money, we want to test it properly. Also, it was a little bit of spaghetti code. It wasn't very well written, and we prefer to not to write code there. It was released once a week, so it was quite slow to release. If we want to go to production, we had to wait for uh, one week and two days of work of QA to, to validate that everything is working fine. So mm, it was buggy. No, it was more like buggy. This this was very buggy. It was very couple. It, there were a lot of context. And these contests were very couple. You can find a user service using an item service. This, yeah. at, the at the same time, it wasn't auditable. And there we, we would find uh, 
con, uh, collisions between consents. Like, for example, a shipping user wouldn't be the same than a back office user or a wallop of users. So we don't have to be dealing with different concepts. And our monolith had a problem with performance. So it, had, it was full of caches, and we don't want to use any more caches. So no, 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 please, let, no, let's not do it there. So what another solution can you do if you don't want to, to write your code in your monolith? Of course, the first solution was a, a, a microservices. What benefits would you have if, if you write your code in a new microservices? It's not easy to implement any microservices. So we realized after studying that the, the, the benefits wouldn't be only technical, but also functional. The first benefit, of course, it could be that uh, we'll be able to try and implement new patterns like SQLRS and uh, event sourcing. We also wanted to try a new language, like it was Kotlin, because Monolith, Monolith was done in Java. And um, we wanted to test it to test properly. We wanted to test properly the microservice because Manolito didn't have end to end. So we wanted to go quiet to production. No? We wanted to be relaxed when we were going to production. And we also wanted to go to production more frequently. Once a week, was, that wasn't very agile. We wanted to go to production every time that a, that a feature was merged into the main branch. So that was a, that was a challenge. At the same time, uh, we have some functional benefits, like for example, we created a whole team just dedicated and working on, the, on achieving the goals of the, of the shipping team. It doesn't mean that uh, this team wouldn't know about the rest of the company, but it would mean that he would be focused on achieving the goals of, uh, of, the, of this project. At the same time, we were working three developers on this repo, on this service, instead of 20 that we were at, the same, uh, at that time. You know when you open a pull request and you, and you have to review the rest of the pull requests of your, of your colleagues? It's, it's not the same reviewing three than, re, than reviewing 40 or 50, no? And especially if they are topics that you don't, you don't, you don't have information about. So in your microservices, that would be more easy. And at the same time, would be out of the release blocks of Manolito. We, we would be able to release whenever we want it. So let's start. Okay, let's start to build this new microservice, but before that, we should be careful with some points. We, what we want to say right now is some recommendations that we had, and yes, they work well. So you don't need everything we are going to describe here, but for us, it was really helpful. For example, this one was an already built API gateway. Uh, this allows you to hide all the microservices between, be, behind you. Uh, later on, we, will, we are going to explain why it helps us this point. Also, another pass for services communication. You all are maybe already know to communicate services with the REST API REST, but in our case, we had another pass. Because we were wanting the event sourcing part, this part was also helpful for us. Also, you should have a good CL and CD pipelines to have your code well tested every time you make something and when you are going to, to production. Also, metrics and monitoring is a good tool to know how your service is performing. A clear new context. This was, was a good one because maybe you can start a new microservice but you don't know what it's going to do. Or maybe you think it's going to do a lot of stuff. Then you are building a new monolith. So in our case, we had shipping project, so it was quite clear our, our context. Also, if you need time, it's not easy. And it takes time, so you should take that into account. So well, now we're ready to start building this mm, now a new microservice. First step was the pipe power domain. This, for us, was one of the best or, or the most important uh, things we did before trying to code something. We had an event storm session. This session consists with all the technical people and product people defining all the entities we had in our system. This means also to define actions and events that occur in that system. So maybe some actions from the team uh, were able to define it and other ones were, were the technical people who were trying to define them. Defining the both context we had. In our case, we split it, we split it in two: delivery and payments. Delivery was in charge of all the delivery processes, 
and payment was in charge of uh, all the payment stuff. Also, this is one of the most important ones, is having a common language. You have to speak in the same language that probably people speak. So, in this case, we had requests, transactions, pay-in, transfer. But even with the effort we put on a uh, whole morning with this session, we have mistakes. Nobody is using requests, and we have it everywhere in our code. So, pay attention to that session. It will be helpful on the future. Also, we had some technical requirements. Uh, some of them were imposed, well, were mid, and other of them were required because we wanted to have a better product, a better technical product. In that case, we wanted resilience. We wanted to be uh, up if Manolito was down. Also, we wanted low coping. We wanted to avoid the tax. Nightmare, we have been manually, so we wanted better performance before having the need to add a new patch. Auditable, because it involves payment, so it should be all very clear. Debugable, also to keep track for everything, the, the, all the payments we have in our system. And also data mining, allow our BI team to check what's going on and create new payments. Uh, prices and so on. Our bet. We decided to go to CQRS and event sourcing. Now we are going to explain it a little bit clearly and how it could help us to achieve all the requirements we have. First of all, CQRS is what I will say before, said before. It was a common and query segregation uh, responsibility segregation. That means that a client sends a common that writes the stuff into our write model. So first, we have a write model. After that, an event, an event is published. This event helps to project many read model projections. And I'm saying many read model projections. How many? It depends on which queries needs the client. Need the client. For example, if the, query, if the client needs some query by ID, you have some print model projection indexed by that ID, and that's it. And if the user needs some other kind of query, you will have another read model projection for that query. What we achieve with that performance? We don't need cats. We have a specific read models for all the queries, so you don't have to uh, use cats. Resilience. We don't care if our write model or read model was down. If our read model was down, it's not a problem. The events eventually will be persisted to will be presented to our read model. So that's also a good point. And the coping. We had write models and read models. Both of them were different. Because maybe you don't need all the info for some kind of answer or some kind of response to the client. And event sourcing. Why event sourcing? You maybe can use, well, you can use secure as without event sourcing, for sure. In our case, event sourcing, it was like a little bit, going a little bit more far, and it's defining how do we want that right model. Usually, we store the final state of the entity. In our case, what we store is the sequence of events that were producing that final state. That was event sourcing. For example, we had one transaction created, so one event persisted. After that, a payment was succeeded, so another event was persisted to the right model. A delivery was registered, also a new one. And at the end, the transaction was finished. So you will have here like a, a, a transaction finished in the final state, but you have where, what was happening for that transaction. <coughs> this means that it's uh, auditable because you know what happened. Data mining, maybe the BI team just only wants to know where uh, something registered. Debugable, because you are also see what, got, what, what, what happened in some point, at some point of time. And we treat, uh, well, we compare events and spirits in the class. What does it mean? We want the events be the most important part in our system. So well, it looks nice. It's, 
we were happy about our decision, so yes. Yeah, it looked nice, but it's not, it wasn't that nice. We were having some, some issues, and not, we didn't have to, even to go to production to, to see these issues, but we found these issues in development time. So, the first issue we found was eventual consistency. And eventual consistency is a funny concept. If you don't know what, it, what this is, it means that all the information in your system will be available for querying it, but at some point in time. It might be in one minute, it might be now, or it might be in two hours. So all the consumers or the clients have to work with this, with this constraint. That information will be there, but at some point. So let's see an example to explain this concept. I don't know if this, if this has a laser or... Well, anyway. So let's see, for example, a user that is accepting an offer. He gets an offer and then he, accepts, he decides to accept the offer. Then an HTTP uh, call will be made to, the, to our system, to our accept, accept offer endpoint. Then we will say, OK. So the offer has been accepted, OK. And then our user will navigate to the next screen. And the next screen is about waiting for the whole, the whole flow to be finished until he finally will have a barcode and he will go to the delivery, delivery system to deliver the, the, the item. And he could be there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. He doesn't know how, how much time. In the meantime, what is going on in the, in the backend is that the offer has been accepted and then we'll create the payment and we'll make the payment in the platform, in the, in the payments platform. Once there, we'll make the, the registry of the delivery in the, the, in the delivery platform. And from there, we will persist the information in our read model. And once it's there, our user can see the information. So it can, it can take time, all this whole flow. So how would we solve this? The first, the first solution was we can do polling, <coughs> which basically is asking for, them, for the information and asking and asking and asking until the information finally is there. But this is not a very beautiful solution, no? And, it, it, and the mobile would be, the, empty, the, the battery would be empty after Five minutes, ten minutes? No, we didn't decide to go to for this solution. And then we thought that why don't we send a real-time sign when the information is ready? I mean, when the whole process, the whole backend process finishes and the, the barcode, the barcode is there in the in the database, we can send a sign on saying, okay, you can retrieve another information. And that, this is basically what we did. So once the backend has finished and the information is there, okay, now you can ask for the information because it will be there. So this is more uh, a easier solution and it will not consume the whole battery of the mobile. The second other problem we have was the lack of knowledge. We were working, we were on our way of learning how to work with events. We were actually quite proficient after some months, but it doesn't mean that the rest of the teams in our company knew how to work with events. So this, the, the, the problem was when, when another system had to retrieve information from, from our system, the problem was that they were not used to work with events, so the problem was they, they basically needed this information and they retrieved this information from, the, from the, our database instead of listening to, to, our, to our events. They needed this information, of course. So basically we solved this by educating the rest of the teams about how to work with events. So it wasn't simple. Another problem we, we found was the deadlines. Of course, this, this project for, for the company was supposed to be a, a competitive advantage of, of their competitors. So they wanted to be the project released as soon as possible, if possible tomorrow. So, um, but at the same time, we as developers, we wanted the solution to be as, as pretty as possible. We wanted the code to be very well tested, decoupled, and really, really, really pure code. So in the end, this, uh, we basically reach an agreement of buying some technical debt. So okay, we want to be clear. We, you want the project tomorrow. We want the project to be clear and well tested. So the solution is let's reach an agreement. And finally, we came up with this concept we call the bot technical debt, which is okay. We'll sacrifice some technical debt, but we have to solve it in the future. But the project will be delivered as soon as possible. And which tech sacrifice we bought? Of course, Manolito. All the information we needed for Manolito, all the functionality that we needed for Manolito was still in Manolito. As, as, as you remember, we're talking about this payment platform we had in Manolito before. We continued using this, this, this functionality and the data that was in there. And to retrieve the information from there, we 
retrieve information from the, from the database instead of moving into the new services. This information was bank accounts and card tokens. Shame, yeah, I know. <laughs> so well, after this shame <laughs> about using now, uh, how did we build our service? We used Kotlin, uh, and we were pretty happy about that because it's quite convenient for it's an evolution for the old Java. But well, Java also is evolving, so I'm not saying anything about Java. <laughs> also Springboot, you maybe all know what, uh, what is Springboot. MySQL as a database, RabbitMQ as a event uh, as a event pass, and also like some framework for the CQLS and event sourcing stuff. I'm going to explain briefly some of them that are quite interesting. First of all, MySQL for an event store. Some of you maybe you think that it's not convenient because there are other solutions for the LM store. In our case, we chose, we chose this one because it was well established, it's transactional, and it was action compatible. But yes, we were aware uh, of the scalability, scalability issues that MySQL can have for large amounts of events. So if you have a large event store, you might have some performance issues. But there are strategies to remove some events from that event store that are all. We are going to explain it later too. Also, find an index tuning for Axel. Axel was not as nice as we thought. We had to tune a little bit more uh, some of the Exxon framework tables to be more performance. But well, at the end, it was, and uh, we are still working with MySQL, and it works quite well. Right to queue for events. Yeah, another uh, choice that may arise some dots. We decided to go with Rabbit because we had previous technical experience with it. Also, it was uh, the cost was low because uh, all we need it was maybe already done with the Rabbit itself. So the library price and the letters was already done. So it was easy to go with uh, Rabbit and queue. Some cons, well, we had uh, one event bus that, uh, it, for all the services and for Manolito, so it could be considered as a single point of failure. But well, we had have, we have, uh, a, a, a cloud one with high availability, with clustered, so it should not happen. It's something that we should use well. And also, it's not as Travis as Kafka, the other one that you can choose for this kind of goal. OK, and what is Axon? Axon is the CQRS and event sourcing framework. Not so. Why we choose Axon? Because it was a Java framework, it was Spring compatible, and it has also transactions. So it was all we need. Uh, some comments about using Axon. Yeah, it was pretty new at, at that time, so we had that, well, uh, Axon had a lot of lack of documentation, the like community was new, and also we had So are we ready to go live with all these uh, microservices that we built? This is a small recap that we had at that moment. We had delivery, we had payments, both of them with event sourcing and the secure uh, pattern, remodel, remodel. Also, we had the, uh, the event pass with Rabbit, and of course, Macbeth. So well, it looked nice, but this time, seeing Monolito, Let's go to product and see what happens. It looked nice, but not that nice again. So once in production, we also find some issues. But let's go through them. The stage one was the product iterations. The product needed to be improved, needed to, to have more functionality once in production, of course. So it has to be maintained and improved. So basically, this means that we, you, add, you need to add new functionality. Adding new functionality was pretty easy because it was about modules and every module was pretty couple. The only couple they have between them was the, the, the event bus, the command bus, the query bus, and, and the events. So they were basically well tested. They didn't know each other, or the system of, of the rest of them. And adding a new functionality was basically adding a new piece of this of code. Test it, add it. And, and so here we didn't have any problem. 
modifying functionality was basically the same. Uh, modifying the existing functionality, test it properly, go to production, so everything okay. The only problem we had was when we had to modify an event, an existing event. So let's say, for example, that your system has this kind of event, payment made event, and it's using only the amount of money, but it's not using currency. If you want to add currency, you will have to add a new field, right? Like currency euros in this case. Uh, in event sourcing, you have to take it to account that it has, it has some point the read model get destroyed and broken, it's down or whatever, it's corrupted. You should be able to recreate and reconstruct and rebuild the, the whole system just by replaying the whole events that you have in your, in your event store. It means just republishing the event from one to whatever until the system is, is, uh, is up again. So that means that an event is an action in the past and an event is a contract that you, should, you shouldn't change. But of course, the first solution that we came up when we had to modify an event was why don't we modify just the event in the event store just by running a SQL query, simple super query, an update, it will take some seconds and that end of the problem. But no, that wasn't a solution because the rest of the team were already using our events. They were already, we educated them, we made them using our events and then we, we cannot change them because we will have information different in, different in, the, in the rest of the systems. So no, that wasn't an option. The next option was version and events. So let's say the same example. The payment made event, you want to add a new field, the currency, you will have payment made v2 event. That was the solution we went for finally, but they had a problem. And the problem is that your system must be able to use, your implementation must be able to use the old version and the new version of the event. So it means double work, double testing, and yeah, we went for this solution, but it it wasn't that, that, that easy. Another solution that we found was the, the fixing events. So same example, you have the payment made, made event, if you want to add in, uh, the, the currency, you can create a payment currency set event that will fix the information in your system. We also have some, we finally went for this solution also, and in the system we, we have events like this. So, stay tuned, the third party integrations. In this project, we were dealing with, th with third-party services like the payments platform and the delivery platform. So working with third-party with third-party services, which is not yours, someone else is maintaining them is always difficult, and you don't want to depend on them if they are down. So let's see this with an example. We have our 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 user. Our user gets an offer, and then he decides to accept the offer. And then when he accepts the offer, he re uh, an offer accepted event is created. Immediately, this event goes to the event bus, to Rabbit. And from Rabbit, it will go to the make payment queue. Once in the make payment queue, our system will listen to this, to this queue, and with the, the information of the event, he will make a payment in the payments platform. From there, we will have a payment made event. This event will go as again to, to, to the event bus, and from then to the register delivery queue. Once there, our system will listen to this event and with information will register the, the delivery. So this is pretty much the, the happy path of our application. But what happens if one of the system is down? What happens if the payment platform is down? We can tell our user, no, can you please stop using the application because our system, our platform system is, is down? We can even blame the platform system in the messages, in the client messages. But Stop making the users not use the application for hours or for even days because the because of third party services down it's not a beautiful solution. No, no. We can make the users we can still serve the users even if they are down. So the solution for this came came up with the dead letter queues. A dead letter queues is a special queue that contains all the all the events that have failed. In this example, we will queue the payment, the, the, the offer as cut event in the, in the dead letter queue. Like this failed. And then after some minutes, one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, we will queue again the message in the event, in, in the event bus and the, this message will be read by, the, by our system once it is in the, once it is in the main make payment queue. So we will start the cycle again, 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 until the information, until finally the, the payments platform is up. So, what do we have with this with this solution with the, the with the dead letters? We have that we didn't have any missing payments. We had no missing delivery registration, and we have happy and very very ignorant users. 
They didn't know if any other platform was down. Stage three. The stage three will involve Manolito independence. We wanted to be independent from Manolito. We, wanted, we didn't want to depend on Manolito. We wanted to be up even if Manolito was down. If Manolito was not serving to our users, we still want to serve our users. They don't, they don't, they don't want, we don't want to depend on him. So what do we do? Of course, moving the remaining functionality that we have in Manolito to our, to our system, which means card and bank account. How did we do that in, those, in two phases? Moving the functionality and making our API gateway to point to our service and migrating data. This was, the, this was the picture at the beginning of the project. All the functionality about bank accounts and credit card was in Manolito. The endpoint, the data. And once we basically migrated this functionality to our service and both functionality payments and, and Manolito was in production, we just said to our API gateway to redirect all the requests to payments instead of to Manolito. Our Manolito was unhappy, of course. The only thing remaining was the migration of the data. And how did we do that? For, for each entity that we have in the, in the Manolito database, we send a command to our system, and, with, with, and once we send a command, the entity, the events, and the views are populated, so the information was there. The important thing about this migration is that yeah, we didn't have downtime. The, the, the application was up the whole time until everything was migrated, the functionality and the data was migrated. We didn't revert, we didn't, we didn't move to, to payments. So we run this migration always in production, no need to, to stop our service. So happy about that. Okay, uh, step four. We had also some issues with the business roles. And our product was evolving, so that means that we had more complex uh, business roles. Let's, let's say some sample here about a small role to see what, what I want to say. We had an offer. So an offer created event was published, so there were code that was handling that event. After that event was handed, another the offer was accepted. So we had also code in so, somewhere in our in our code that were hand, and that was handling uh, the offer accepted event. Also, the transaction was created. So the same, a new transaction created event, and somewhere in our code that was handled. The same, make payment, payment made event, more code, register delivery, same, more code. As you see, we had five places in our code that, that, were, that were handling the full code. That means that we have this. It was hard for us to see where we are and what was going on in our system. For example, if we had somebody in the customer support uh, asking what happens if our transaction is failed or something like this, we have to go into the code, see where was it, where was that subscriber, and keep following the, 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 all the, the, the code until we reach the final uh, what, is, what happened. So that was hard. Also, we had to store the raw state. As you notice, if, you, if we have some many places in code, we had to store for each step in which state was the code. So we had projections for offers, for the transaction status, for the payment status, and the delivery status. So it had, it, it, we had to build more uh, read model projections that we supported, and it's time. It's time. So finally, what should we do? SAGAS. SAGAS is like a subscriber, but not for only one event. It's a subscriber for a full flow of events. It defines a full flow. Let's see an example. What we have here is the same that we explained before, but just in one place. We have the event handed on the first line. Um, yes, it works. Uh, here we handle the request accept event, then we handle the transaction built event, the delivery of the event, and the payment made event. That means that all the flow logic was in one place, was 
easy to trace, easy to read, and easy to test because we were able to see it faster and it is what was going on in the globe. Also, the SARS stores its own state. So we don't need any more, more useless projections that were keeping the state of the flow. That was one of the biggest improvements we made in production, and it helped us a lot. Finally, stage five. We have also some issues with the responsibilities of delivery, service microservice, and payments microservice. We started with the uh, is known as shared camera. What does it mean? It means that we have our delivery service and our payment service, and payments knew a lot of the delivery service. What does it mean? Transaction created event in delivery. This event was through the event bus, and payment service was handed at the event. Payments was deciding that if some transaction was created, then we should charge a user. So who was in charge of making that decision? Payments. But who was really in charge to know when to charge a user or pay that user back? It was delivery. He knew about all the business flow. So that was quite uh, inconvenient because if we had to add a new flow in delivery, we had to replicate stuff on payments. So that would work. It was working well. So what we tried? Customer supply. That means that we have a new, uh, well, you no, know, uh, it's a delivery custom uh, core, it was delivery, and payment was a support service. The same example. Instead of letting payments to the side, we made a REST API call to payments to make that payment, to charge the user. That means that now who is in charge to decide when to charge that user? Delivery. So at least it has been many months that we haven't had any lightning payments because payments was responsible for uh, all the 3DS stuff, all the, the problems with Sprout, the know your customer, so payment stuff, no delivery stuff. And right now we are only working uh, with delivery. So, well, right now we are at this point but we have, uh, our product is still working and it's uh, pretended to be uh, one of the important things in Wabo. So we had also more things to work on. For example, keep splitting models. We have to be, uh, well, we take uh, the payments stuff from Monolito, but we keep doing it in a dedicated process. That means that we should work Receiving more things that Monolito has to be at least in the method, fully independent from Monolito. Test between services. We had all our services quite well tested. We have a few issues going to prod, but yes, when we change something on, on, on some events or something like that, uh, well, you all may know that microservices have these, uh, these issues. We should improve our test between our, our services. And also we have some questions. How does it scale? We, our product has been uh, each month uh, getting more and more users, but well, we have our constraints about well, MySQL, maybe it cannot scale up with the event store, but we have some solution. So right now we haven't got any issue, any performance issue right now, but maybe it could happen in the future. So we are planning some strategies to avoid that issue if it happens. Also, be less action dependent. Action help us, but it also some, has some magic that we don't like. So maybe we will try to, to get rid of it and use some uh, some stuff with in house. Uh, finally, conclusions of our adventure of going through this um, this microservice of secure resident and susi always work in iterative processes. You shouldn't aim for the 100% perfect microservice. You, may, you should make some concessions sometime in order to be able to, uh, to write code fast and to deliver value faster. Build new stuff or start monolith. This is a, for us, it's like an always common sense because it allows us to, to produce stuff from monolith without uh, sacrificing um, deadlines. 
also end sourcing. And so seeing some of you and some of uh, ask us if it worth it. And for yes, for us, yes, it worth it. But maybe it's not for every project. You should take that into account because it adds some kind of some complexity layer that if you don't need some out of cover stuff or something like editing development based on well consider uh, consider a citizen class. You maybe should go only with secure less, right? that's one point that we recommend, but without going to with other sourcing. And most of the learnings came up in production. So that helped us to improve, as we saw, as we saw with the old stage we went through, to improve our model, to improve technically our system without having major issues about delivery, deliverability. Uh, deliver value to our company. Yeah. Yeah, and release as soon as possible to see these problems. These were good learnings, but for me the more the most important learning here was respect your monolith. Have a good relationship with your monolith, of course, because he was in the end he was the creator of the company. He made the foundation of the company. So please love him, have a good relationship with him, but slice him little by little. So <laughs> Thank you very much. If you have any question, I think we have three minutes left, or, yeah. So in the example with the delivery and payment service, where you went from the asynchronous message passing back to synchronous notification, how do you deal with the service being unavailable? Because now delivery has to rely on something that's synchronous and might not be available all the time. How did you deal with that? What do you mean? In, 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 in which slide? Sorry? So, the example of the delivery and payment service? Oops. It just felt like way too much. Uh, uh, this one. Oh. Oh? I don't know. Wow. Wow. This one. This one? No, just, just towards the end of the talk, you were talking about the delivery and the payment service. Okay. You had the model where first was sending commands asynchronously and payment was dealing with them. Then you went back to a synchronous support service model where now delivery invokes payment synchronously. Okay. okay. Right? And so that implies that if payment is unavailable, delivery is stuck dealing with that. So how did you actually handle that? Yeah, it's, an, it's, it's starting with the same problem we, we, we were mentioning actually in this with the dead letters. Yeah. Okay. No? Yeah. With the dead letters. We consider for delivery, payment was like a third party service, another third party services. So if delivery was down, you just resend the, 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 the event to the dead letter and then it will be again redirected to the event bus and then it's like another pile I'm here, but instead of having the payment platform, you have payment service, which is basically the same. And yeah. Um. What happens if you can't produce event to your event bus? So I guess you retry, right? And how do you manage the potency of the events? Well, uh, yeah. well Anson provides some stuff for helping you with that. We use as the event IDs, uh, uh, UIDs. So if we had some kind of repeated event on repeated event, uh, Anson doesn't allow to persist that event. So in that case, we were fine, but we had all the cases that, for example, when we were making the call to the third party payments, uh, we had to deal with that. Uh, we were lucky because our payment platform was allowing us to the potentialities, so we were using it. Uh, but yes, it may happen. It happened once that we had a 500 um, error from our third party payment service, and the payment was done. So we were retrying that payment, and the user was charged. Twice. So, uh, in that case, what we use is a kind of solution that we are checking for that and potentially that is the LNID if it's something done in our third party service before retiring something. And we have some kind of defensive code to solve that issue. That it was the hardest issue we had with this kind of solution we use. Yeah. How did you ensure transactionality in, in like, for example, if a payment is made, but then you are going to publish the message and wrap the queue down, how did you ensure that 
the event will be eventually published, but the, pay, the, the payment will then go. Yeah, uh, it's quite similar to what I, I, I told to, to I told him. Is so we have, uh, for example, an issue with uh, with Rabbit, but the payment was done. We are checking before any retrial of that event if the payment was done. For example, uh, <clears throat> we make a payment. We are going to publish the event to the Rabbit MQ, and then it fails. So. The previous event that was involved in all this chain uh, was uh, was to think that it did better. So we retried that event. We tried to make them the payment, but using the event potency key, the payment service says, "Okay, it's already done." So we had defensive code saying that payment was tried before. So let's find the new event of payment made event. So everything was fine on that case. But we should take care of that situation too. We have many of them. For example, with we, had, we had some cases as well, so that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. I, I don't think we have any more time. I think it's time. So if you have any more questions, you can approach us anytime to, today, tomorrow. So, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.